Hi, I'm Chuang. Thanks for coming by my channel, Do More. Um, again, it's all about doing business, uh, becoming a good investor, and being the best person it can be. So today I talked to this guy called Mali Imtia Sawa. He's one of the most famous constitutional lawyers in Malaysia. And today we take a bit of a break from the norm. We talk about the rule of laws, the, um, the kind of things that affect every single person in the country, especially in this new era of Malaysia Baru. I hope you enjoy. Imtia is a very smart guy, very intelligent, and very lucid in all matters legal. So thank you for coming by. If you like this video, uh, please comment on it, tell me what you think, share it, and um, have fun. Thank you. Imtiaz, thank you, mate. Thank you for doing this. Um, big big honor, big privilege. Um, you guys in the law, uh, us in the media, we are often cynical appreciators or observers of what's happening in the country in the region, in the world. Um, these are crazy times. Crazy times in the world and crazy times in Malaysia. Um, let's let's kick off the discussion with your views on what the hell is happening in Malaysia right now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not an easy question at all. Um, but I think it comes back to frames of reference. Uh, you know, let me just start by saying uh, the GE in 2013, everyone was so pumped up after 2008. Everyone thought, here's the change coming. And then um, people were saying, ah, oh, well, if it doesn't happen this time, you know, it's the end, it's finished, it's over. And then it didn't happen. The government remained as it was. Um, and the next day, people got up and sent their kids to school and carried on with their lives. You know, life didn't end. Um, and then 2018, it happened, change of government. And people were like, amazing. Uh, wow, how did this happen? Well, these are the same people who were saying in 2013, if it didn't happen, it was over. So I guess, uh, you know, history is something that you look at in different frames of reference. If you look at it within the space of two years, a lot has happened. If you look at it within the space of 10 years, maybe not enough has happened. If you look at it in the space of 60 years, clearly um, what's happened is insufficient to, to address it. So as to where we are right now, I think it's a mess. Um, it's frustrating. Uh, leave aside party politics or political affiliations. It's just the fact that one assumes that in a democracy uh, where there are elections, changes of government would happen through uh, the elections and governments be given the full term to try and work out what they have to do. Um, again, don't think about the politicians, think about the businesses, think about the human factors involved. Every time there's an upheaval um, and, uh, uh, or, or a change of systems or anything like that. So I guess that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that where things are right now is a mess, but I don't necessarily think they are for the worse. Um, to some people, it might be a setback. To some other people, it might be a correction, a chance for re, uh, regrouping, a recollection, or whatever. But I think we have no choice, really, in the matter but to look forward and see how best to, to deal with things as they are. Yeah, I think a lot of people in Malaysia don't realise that um, administrations come and go. I mean, Austra I cite Australia in the last 10 years, they've had at least four, maybe five different governments. I mean, it's Labour back and forth, but, you know. Um, and until G14, we had only one government and people assumed that was the only government they ever should have, right? Um, and, and, and that's what I was trying to say, because, you know, when you up to G14, the, exp the impression was that if the government changed, the sky would fall on our head. It didn't. And it didn't. And, and that's something that's really valuable uh, for us to have seen. And it's also something very valuable for young Malaysians to have seen, um, uh, to see, uh, to, to have viewed it through impressions created by their elders, uh, with all the fear and the baggage that came with that. And then to see that it happened without the kind of consequences they thought, and to have seen some traction, uh, some voice given to, to Malaysians, um, you know, uh, more latitude in terms of public expression of what they thought, uh, how they thought about things politically or otherwise. And um, now they have a frame of reference or a point of reference. So I, I guess one of the problems we always had was there had nothing to compare it to uh, for us. Sure, we could look elsewhere and say, oh, look at how things are there. But for Malaysians, as you say, we only had one government all those years. So in terms of compar comparison, you could only compare the current version with the old version, and then sort of try and work out what the differences were between the two. But now we've been shown a different thing altogether, and now we have something to compare against. Uh, even in the space of two years or whatever, we've, we've seen things that may help us understand how, how to look 
at things as we move forward and create those expectations and express those expectations. I mean, but Imtia, cert certainly among my peers, um, there's a lot of, it's almost like a resigned um, uh, conclusion or uh, p people have become resigned to the fact that they can't um, dictate their futures or nor, in, nor in fact can they dictate the governments um, but you pointed out earlier that uh, this is not something which necessarily is a negative thing yeah and I think you're right because there's always the scope to see things from a half full perspective right yeah um, and by early indications it seems as if it's okay because the, the new attorney general seems okay um, should we should should we allow ourselves to think that maybe maybe Malaysia is still on the path of growing up, not going backwards? No, I think that's very important for us to hold on to. Um, and I think what's distressing right now for me is that so many years uh, uh, of of like civil society efforts and activism, etc., was spent on was spent on creating that hope, and that hope then translated into an outcome. But as you say, those outcomes are never static. What we must not lose is this idea that we are capable of being change agents. And yes, okay, things happen in a way that uh, w was not expected, perhaps. Um, uh, there is a justification that you know, says this is validly done because the constitution doesn't prevent it. Certainly it's been allowed. Sure. It's, it's, and not, that, it's not ab illegal. Absolutely, and that may be so. And, but, but then you try and find other ways of expressing that, that, um, that, uh, that hope. So, um, and I, th I think this is especially true for younger Malaysians, because I mean, I mean uh, our generation, I think we're the same age or more or less, uh, we've been through a lot. Um, um, one of my friends in civil society was saying, oh my gosh, I don't think I can do that many more years of whatever it is we were doing before, another, another uh, birthday thingy or, or whatever it is. But then the answer to that is, well, it's not up to us anymore. It's really up to young Malaysians to now say, OK, this is the world we live in now, um, where to some extent, I think, uh, emphasis on, on leave aside the politics, emphasis on race uh, and religion is to an extent lessened uh, in as much as it's made, it may have been ratcheted up politically in some ways. But um, that's important because you have younger Malaysians who have all been to the same primary schools, the same secondary schools, who speak the same bad English, um, who have the same problems in getting jobs, now stuck in the same boat wondering what they should be doing and what sort of life they want. And for these people now, watching all these changes happen and how it's being done is relevant information for them to decide their response and what kind of life they want. Um, and I think it's, it's not necessarily for the, for, for the worse. Short term, perhaps, it may impact on certain ideas or certain transformations, but we can still hold the government accountable as we did in 2018 at the ballot box. And that's still very much possible. There is still a, vi vi a vibrant opposition, even if you, sp if you pare it down. I mean, they've got, what, 90, 92 seats or something. That's a still a very, very healthy opposition presence. So I think you may have... Um, a, a very interesting dynamic evolving out of this that, that we should try and be hopeful about. And we should not give up on this idea of trying to, to hold governments to account. And you know, if you look at the current appointment of the, the, the newest uh, Attorney General, um, by all accounts, he's a, he's a, he's a good man. Um, federal court judge, very strong on rule of law, uh, objective, um, and doesn't seem to me to be the kind of person who will pander uh, to uh, expectations of a political nature. He will go by what the law is. And so there's, I think, yeah, it's half empty, half full, right? So yeah. I, I think there's plenty to, to look forward to in trying to address what we want to be. And, and I'll just say this, that for so many years, we were being told that if you are a Malaysian, you are this, that one product. But what we've seen happening in the last five to 10 years is you know is an explosion of identity in many ways as different people come out with different ideas of who they are what they are uh, this homogeneity that that works to advantage in some political quarters not necessarily the kind of identity that that many of us want uh, or, or even uh, embrace now as time passes with with improvements in media in in social media in in tech developments etc you can't put that genie back into the bottle now, what we become is ultimately up to us. And, uh, and if we're going to try and shape that 
and, and, and push it along lines that are constructive or whatever, we have to find a new narrative, we have to find new language, we have to find new means of engagement, issues to engage over. Um, and all of these things, I think, give me, uh, in as much as I'm depressed as the next person um, and frustrated at the fact that we're going to be facing yet another period of instability, um, uh, I, I think you have to take the positives from it and, and run with it as far as you can. No, I think you've got a point. Um, and much as I don't like to talk about politics on this on this channel, it, it's, you know, it is as much a part of our fabric in, in Malaysian life as it is in anywhere else around the world. Um, there was initial resignation. There was initially a lot of fatigue, um, anger, um, all kinds of emotions. But then there's also a sense now of optimism, right? Because... Yes, change is inevitable. Sometimes change is painful. Sometimes change is, is also um, comforting, right? Yeah. Um, and given the triple whammy that's happening in Malaysia now, you've got this COVID virus thing going on. You've got the political turmoil in Malaysia. You've also got this, um, you know, the economic issues around the world. Um, you get the sense that there's only one way but up. And yeah. um, well, well, I, I think I, ca I can. Certainly, the sense is is is, is, is a growing sense of optimism. Yeah, and also a, a growing sense of um, uh, expectation um, and in that I think for, for the first time in a long time, um, people are going to want answers because now there are tangible threats. COVID-19 is not something to trifle with. It's a bipartisan issue. Yeah, it doesn't and matter what you know, colour you yeah, are. Right? And I think people are, are going to get out there and say, what's going on? And, and how is this going to affect us? That people are going to be asking the same question about the economy. They're going to say, how is this, you know, whatever is happening in the, at the global level, we're talking possibly of a global recession. How is that going to impact on us? Uh, how, is, how is the government going to deal with all of that? I'm mean, seeing as how you figured that, I mean, the government figured that it was in a, in a better place to, to lead the country, then all these answers are, are going to be expected. So I think in that sense, uh, why is that a bad thing? Yeah. You know? um, and uh, I, I think it's a form of evolution moving forward. Um, and I, I don't think Malaysia is, is, is a place where we can say things are either black or white anymore. And I think over the last five years, maybe a bit more, that's become very distinct for me, um, quite clear. Um, and the fault lines in the old narrative are now all beginning to emerge as you see uh, various tensions developing in the institutions, uh, ways of looking at, at, at public uh, law, uh, things in the public sphere. That, that difference of opinion or difference of viewpoint is, is coming across more and more. I'll give you an example, right? You look at what's happening in the federal court on, uh, in a number of cases uh, in the last, um, uh, since 2018, because uh, post 2018, when uh, Tan Sri Richard Malanjum became the Chief Justice, um, uh, he um, essentially told his judges that he welcomed dissenting uh, viewpoints. And um, uh, one of the, f I mean, the first case that the court sat on as nine judges, which was reserved for cases of great constitutional importance, was a case that I argued. Um, and I remember being in court that morning and being amazed at the fact that I was interacting with nine senior justices of the, of the Malaysian judiciary. Everyone had their own views about things, and they were not um, hesitant to express that view. And, and for the first time as, as a practitioner, I could now see a fairly clear ideological spectrum on the bench, which I thought was for the best. I mean, in, in, when you look at the US Supreme Court, you tend to look at the conservatives, you look at the liberals, that kind of language has developed in their uh, 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 legal commentary. Uh, and for the first time, I could actually see those demarcations in a way that I thought was encouraging. So it didn't matter that at the end, the majority went, or five went one way, and you had the Chief Justice in the minority. We've seen a similar situation happen more recently. Um, what's important is you're, you're getting these different viewpoints being expressed by, by persons who we previously would have thought were only capable of one uh, monolithic viewpoint, um, the conservative one. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, um, and and I think that's that's for the for the better, and that could have only happened if we had the kind of change that allowed for it, the evolution that happened, uh, that led to that point, you know. Um, uh, so I think there's there's if we if we just took a step back, and and sort of calmed ourselves and said put away all that panic for a minute and look at things objectively, the institutions are still there. 
Some of them are still being manned by the people who were in before the change of government, and they're there for a, a good number of years. The Chief Justice is, um, I think, 60. She's got till 66 before she hits the official retirement age. Uh, the Election Commission Chair, he's got quite a number of years. He can't be just removed at will. He has to be impeached if, unless he resigns. Um, so there's, there's still uh, things there that I think uh, uh, should make us uh, sort of pause for a minute when we think, oh my gosh, we're regressing or reverting, which is something I see on social media being said quite a lot. I think, mm, no, I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, um, I think there's, it's, it's, there's still a lot of possibilities, um, and, and I think we should just keep on pushing. The latest incarnation of Malaysia <laughs> um, is incredible, incredible MTS. Uh, in the last even 10 years, we've had three prime ministers, albeit two of, of them were the same person. <laughs> um, no, sorry, yeah, but, but the same kind sure. of like um, uh, structures. Um, where do Malaysians stand in this new era, though, in terms of... I, I think the key things for the ordinary person are the, the right to dissent, yeah. the right to speak up, the right to um, peaceful assembly, the right, you know, civil liberties, human rights, essentially. Um, where do Malaysians stand in the new era of Malaysia Baru? Okay. Um, well, you know, I think first and foremost, I'd say that as a matter of theory, at least, uh, civil liberties are guaranteed by the Constitution. We have um, a written Constitution which actually has a, a whole part devoted to just this. Has it been like amended like about 300 times but already? Not, not the parts on, um, uh, on the fundamental liberties, as we call them. Okay. In the Constitution, they described as fundamental liberties. Um, I think where there was an amendment, it was to make it even more uh, embracing. So um, the equality guarantee was amended some time ago to include gender, uh, to prevent discrimination on grounds of gender. So as a matter of theory, they're there. The law is there. Uh, the protections are there. What's, what's perhaps been a problem uh, historically was um, the approach to those, uh, to the application of those of those rights, uh, the enforcement. Because when we talk about human rights and civil liberties, we're talking about the extent to which the government does not encroach or protects those rights. And generally, when you say someone's human rights are lost, you're saying that the government has either encroached or impeded, or uh, unfairly limited, or has failed to protect one or the other. But I think moving, uh, if we look at it from the, sp from, from the uh, sp say, in the span of 10 years, what we've seen is, is a very, very clear evolution for the better. Um, and in the last three years, we've had a number of um, judgments of the federal court that have emphasized the, the importance of fundamental liberties, the uh, role of the courts to protect uh, through uh, judicial review, um, uh, the point that uh, Parliament cannot legislate to exclude the court's power to review and that there must be access to justice, those are all there. So at least from one standpoint, uh, the protections of the court, um, uh, human rights has, I think, moved forward. Um, of course, it comes back to the independent individual judges who are sitting, and you know there, there may be some cultural issues or, or um, um, acclimatization that has to happen as as change in perspectives happens. Then, when you look at it in terms of the other institutions, uh, the police. Um, the MACC uh, and uh, other agencies involved. I think to some extent there's, there's more heightened awareness uh, of their responsibilities. Uh, so even like recently with the, the protests that, that took place um, post in, um, in near Sogo. That's uh, right. The, That's uh, right. Uh, and we had Marina and um, uh, Ambiga. Um, this was on the day that uh, the new Prime Minister was sworn in. Um, you didn't see uh, uh, a reversion back to the old way of doing That's things. That's a sign of maturity. No, I think so. And yeah. you know, there, was an, there was an acceptance Even that... Even the yeah. handover of G14 was peaceful and, and smooth. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was. I, I think that that's correct. Um, and I, from what I gather, it's all anecdotal. I think a large part of that was due to the maturity shown by the um, police. Uh, and the head of the police at that point, who, who, who said, well, this is, this is our mandate and this is what we have to do. So the handover was then ensured in a peaceful way. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think in that way there's a lot more discussion. Uh, if there is any issue, then I think it would be with regards to uh, the impact of Islamic law in, in the public sphere. 
and there things are a little bit murky um, in as much as they may be getting a bit clearer. Um, I won't say better or worse, it's just clarity is what people want. Um, uh, and that's still a sticking point for, for, for obvious reasons because you know, it features so heavily in, in the political construct of this country. So I, I would say that I think on the whole, there's greater awareness, greater sensitivity, and uh, uh, acceptance to a certain extent of the fact that people are entitled to say this. Uh, people are entitled to say, hey, what you're doing is impacting on me and I have a right not to be impacted on in that way. I think this is becoming a little bit more normalized for us. Do you, th do you see anywhere around the world where there is a judicial system that mirrors Malaysia, insofar as that there's two legal systems that affect the peoples of that country? One is the civil courts where you know, all Malaysians are uh, um, answerable to, and the one where there's a Sharia court where only Muslims are answerable to. And that causes this, this, this gray area which you've just described. Yeah, I, I um, think, I think is, that is anything to be taken from those? other jurisdictions? Uh, not particularly because I think in those jurisdictions where it's happening it's quite a uh, quite <laughs> quite um, worrying state of affairs you know um, I, I'm thinking maybe Nigeria for example uh, although in terms of the formality of the systems I'm not sure there's there's one that can be equated with ours so uh, w by that what I mean is we have a constitution that recognizes the right of state assemblies to make Islamic laws Okay, so unlike, um, uh, so, so that, that means the state assemblies have a power to legislate in respect of matters of Islamic law within a, within a confine. Um, un unless and until those laws are made, there is no Islamic law. So that, that is one area of, of, of some uh, ambiguity because there is one view that Islamic law exists and it should just be applied. But you know, as I understand the constitutional structure, there must be law for it to, to be applied. And then there are certain boundaries. Um, but um, in as much as I think, in theory, again, there could be quite a satisfactory coexistence of the two systems, it calls for a clear understanding of the, of the divide. Um, and we had that previously. Um, in the early 90s, um, we had uh, a Supreme Court decision that says Islamic law is limited to the public, uh, to the to the personal sphere, and all matters of public law are, are matters of public law, and there's a there's a divide. But over the years, what we've seen is we've, um, um, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, we've seen a blurring of that line, in part because. Uh, uh, Politicians tended to fall back to uh, race and religion for 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 um, to progress their agendas. Um, education um, of persons who went into the public service was to some extent influenced by Islamic uh, thinking and thoughts, and this idea that uh, Islamic personal Islamic morality was a relevant consideration in discharge of public functions. That's been happening. Um, and so that's an area that I think has now ended up with sometimes decisions being made more on moral lines than they are on strictly legal lines. Um, so you know, when we go into a court, we always talk about the court being a court of law and not a court of morals. Unfortunately, um, in, in, in my experience, what's happened is there is a tendency for certain uh, persons, um, Muslims, who, who feel that because Islam is an all-embracing way of life, that separation cannot be validly upheld, and they feel obliged as individual Muslims to actually uh, br uh, bring to bear their own uh, moral perspective on things. So that's led to a certain amount of uh, ambiguity. So I think if we could restate the lines and say, well, this is where things are, and this is how we can coexist, then I think the system could work very, very well. So in as much as we think that progress is still being made, albeit incrementally, um, MTS, how do Malaysians take this forward? Because that ambiguity is something which exists still today, right? Yeah. Who, who is responsible for, pro for progressing the clarity of this agenda? Is it the government? Is it the judiciary? Is it the people themselves? Is it the courts of law? And which courts of law? The, the Islamic courts or the uh, civil courts? Yeah. So, I, I mean, as a lawyer, I'll say the courts are the last uh, 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 place you want to go to for clarity on these things. 
um, uh, generally across the globe. Because uh, they caught too much in the min minutia? Uh, one, and also it's not for the courts to define um, define religion in a way. Um, it's for it's for the other actors in society to define that. However, they may, however we might want to want to perceive that. So, so I'll give you an example. All right, um, you take the uh, Allah case. That was a while ago. Uh, so you have a situation where the herald was told they can't use a certain word. And to me, when the Home Minister said you can't uh, in his decree or order, uh, that, was, that, that order was made on the basis that it would be counted to public order. Okay? So the issue before the High Court was a simple one. Would this objectively lead to a possibility of public disorder? And the answer was yes or no. Um, unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, that, that case became about freedom of religion. Right? And it was decided on that basis. At the Court of Appeal, the counter narrative was then put on it, and you had Court of Appeal judges saying, no, well, Islam allows for this and Islam allows for that, and we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that. So you had the judges sitting as arbiters of religion when it should never have been that way. Yeah. And then when it went to the federal court, I would have thought the federal court would grant leave to appeal and then bring it back to the simple question of whether there was sufficient basis for the minister to conclude that there was a real threat to public order. If there was, and it was objectively um, ascertainable, that was the end of it. If it wasn't, that was the end of it as well. So that's an example of how... What seems like such a simple yeah. bi binary decision in a way yes. had to go all the way to the highest court in the land and, and, and still not get reach, resolved. Yes. yes. So you see, for example, you can compare that with the, uh, with the decision of uh, Justice Arif, in, who's the current speaker when he was a high court judge. Um, uh, Sisters in Islam had a book that was banned. Um, and the the, uh, the notice from the Home Minister says that said that it would uh, be a threat to no it was a pub it was a threat it would cause public disorder rather than a threat to public disorder. So when we got before the judge, uh, I was representing Sisters in Islam. Um, the judge says, "Okay, let me see the uh, evidence that supports the conclusions of the Home Minister that it, there's a disruption of public order." And of course, there was none because the book had been in circulation for two and a half years without riots and so on and so forth. So Justice Arif says that in that case, there's nothing more to talk about. He, he struck it down. And the Court of Appeal affirmed that thinking. And that's an example of how if the courts just understood that their role was to enforce the law or to apply the law as, 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 as it's been enacted, it would be as simple as that. Which takes me back to the point that you do not want to get judges involved in the, <laughs> in the clarification yeah. of faith. So then coming back to, to, to the other actors, so you have government agencies that make a lot of money, or rather, so I beg your pardon, that, that get a lot of money on the budget uh, to further... That's a Freudian slip right there. might be there, yeah. <laughs> uh, to further the, the, the agendas of those departments, right? Yes. Um, and it's in their interest to make things more heavily regulated, more subject to approvals, yes. et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a different aspect of all of this. And I don't know whether we really need that, because if you look at other, other countries where you have large Muslim populations, the States, UK, no one's complaining about uh, Muslims being under siege or anything. OK, now, you know, with, with certain issues of terrorism and so on and so forth, perhaps. But putting that aside for a minute, um, generally, they're allowed to practice faith as they want to. Whereas here, we're being told that we need to be regulated in order to practice faith as we want to. And we're being told by the state that what we want to practice is actually what the state is deciding. And that comes through the various fatwas and so on and so forth. So the apparatus of state has been, involved, has been, has been too heavily involved in this process, I think, uh, to make it now something that's easily resolved. Because you'll have all these different power centers having to ultimately accept that this is, these are where the boundaries lie. So think about the fact that there is this push for an, Islam, um, is an attorney general for the Sharia courts. Um, this is a problem. Uh, conceptually, I have a real difficulty with this because Sharia law is a matter for the states. Each state has its own Sharia set up. You can't have one unifying attorney general, and yet you have a push for it, or a chief justice, or a whatever it is, because they, the, the, the certain quarters are hell-bent on pushing forward this agenda that the Islamic courts sit on the same level as the civil courts. 
And therefore, what you're talking about in terms of two systems means that. And then with all the attendant complications that we've seen, because when you have a chance to argue a position based on Islamic law, it will be argued. And then it will place the, the civil judge, who may or may not be a Muslim, in a position where he's thinking, why on earth am I, or, sh or he or she's thinking, why on, earth and why on earth am I being put into this, having to resolve this conflict? I don't want anything to do with this. But over the years, we've created these conflicts over and over again, and we've tied ourselves all up into knots. Yeah, it seems almost ironic because, I mean, having established that we are, in a way, maturing as a society, we're growing up, yeah. we're becoming more aware of ourselves as people and as of our rights as well. Yeah. But at the same time, the strictures and the, the confines seem to be getting tighter and tighter. At least, well, at least for a segment of the population. Yeah. So it's 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 it's, yeah. it's so typical of Malaysia. I'm we, not sure we have can, a bit yeah. of this and we have a bit of that. And but I'm not sure you can say it's just affecting one segment because there's a knock-on effect. Isn't uh, absolutely, it? because we, we exist in, in Together, the same country. Yeah. That's right. And so um, and that's something that I think if we really want to move forward, this is not to say that we do away with Islamic law. It's there. The constitution allows for it. But I think mature thought has to be given to a holistic approach that is defined by the constitutional guarantees um, and not from the perspective of someone who thinks aspirationally it would be better to have an Islamic system. So if the constitution was chucked out and a new constitution was put in which had Islamic law as the supreme law, that's a different thing. But when you have a constitution that says what it does and says that it is the supreme law, which it does, then I know there are many quarters out there that have aspirations that they wish that constitutional law was like this instead of that. Now, if that is thought as law, and that's to some extent happening in some of the institutions, then this confusion is going to proliferate. But if we can accept that this is what the constitutional arrangement is, this is what it's always meant to be, and if we want change, this is what we have to do, uh, that might be the start of how we can unravel this. So, you know, I mean, take, take, again, not getting into politics, but just in terms of concepts. Think about uh, PAS, okay, the Islamic uh, 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 Party. So their mandate is uh, based on, on the Quran, fine, Islamic Sharia. I, I have no problems with that. But their ability to come together as a political uh, uh, party is only possible because of the constitution. Ironic, isn't it? Yeah, so the freedom to, asso to associate on that uh, basis with that political ideology is guaranteed to them by the constitution. And yet, we sometimes hear opposition to any contrary views to what it is that they're saying. But that's a guarantee that's also in the constitution. And as much as they're entitled to say what they're saying, everybody else is entitled to say what they're saying as well. But then when the state gets involved in that and starts policing what we can say about this subject on the grounds that it's sensitive, then how are you going to unravel this mess? And so there's too much sensitivity, I think, trumped up or otherwise. Uh, and that's something that we need to also address because if we don't start talking about things, it's always going to be uh, precious. It's always going to be a problem. And if we don't talk about these things, we're always going to be living in fear. And how do we then progress as a society? I, I, don't, I don't get it. But I understand that this kind of um, captive thinking is useful. Uh, to some. And so ultimately, it will come back to the voter base to say, we reject whoever it is that wants to trap us into this hostage situation for their own purposes. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that young Malaysians now have a wonderful opportunity to look at things uh, on the basis of comparison, not just with Pakatan Harapan or otherwise, but just in terms of what they're seeing everywhere else in the world, and saying, what kind of life do I want to, be, uh, to have in this country, and why can't I have that? That's the important question. Uh, and I think it's a question that we are all entitled to ask and should be asking repeatedly, right? instead of just accepting one idea of how we should live. In any functioning society, um, with aspirations of being fully developed, MTR's uh, the legal system, paramount importance, right? You, you need to have structure, you need to have which side is right and wrong, and you need arbiters of that, um, either side of it. Um, the rule of law in Malaysia is something which has been said that is, is not necessarily as strong as it is than, say, a Singapore, for example. 
arguably. Mm. Um, do you think things are changing? Well, uh, okay. Again, it comes back to um, how uh, the institutions approach their their role in, in protecting the rule of law. I think. I mean, Made has this thing where he always talks about rule of law and rule by law, and he he he. That was his uh, message uh, for yeah, G14. And, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? and then and then but at the Law Asia conference, I heard him say, "Well, you know, rule of law is what Parliament makes, uh, uh, what laws Parliament makes, and some of those laws are bad, some of those laws are good." All right, we'll put that aside for a minute. I think um, fundamentally, everyone accepts that there is meant to be rule of law in this country, so everyone will say. Whether they mean it or not is a different thing, but they will say when asked and they will declare that we have a written constitution that is the supreme law of the land. Okay? From there emanate all these institutions and organs of state which are all meant to operate in a way that the constitution uh, provides for, with the separations of power, with the limitations on power, with the transparency and accountability expected, etc. So lip service is paid to this concept all the time. So, to that extent, if you ask me, we have the rule of law. Now take it to the next step of whether or not that's actually brought into practice. So this is where you'll find people saying, well, the constitution doesn't quite say that, or the constitution doesn't really say I can't do it, right? And one example that comes to mind recently, uh, or, or that took place quite recently, was the extension of the Chief Justice and, and the President uh, Tun Rouse was extended beyond his retirement age plus six months, which is what the Constitution provides for. And, you know, um, that was a point that could perhaps be debated both ways. Ultimately, the pr popular view was it shouldn't have been done because even though it doesn't say you can't work it out that way, the spirit of the Constitution requires this. Okay, so... I've written elsewhere. Uh, I've said I've said in many many different uh, on different occasions that I never thought that interpretation of the constitution would be the main battleground of the rule of law in this country. When I was studying law, you know, you you assume that certain concepts have clear meanings and they're meant to be what they are. But you also realize as you grow up as a lawyer that you can argue anything, any which way you want. It's just a question of whether you're prepared to look stupid when you're doing it or not. Right. Absolutely. So if if um, uh, someone's prepared to say something, and that you have an adjudicator that's prepared to say yes, I accept that view, then things can go awry. So it comes back to common points of reference and what the base standards are. Constitutions are written um, in general terms because they're meant to be documents, as Shad Faruqi puts it, of destiny. They're supposed to be there for all eternity to give us uh, the guideline and the framework to progress, evolving as we do. Right? And, and we've seen that happen in the US and in Australia, where they have written constitutions, uh, unlike the UK, where, where, which, which doesn't. And you've, you know, take, take the interpretation of, um, of uh, whatever, I can't remember now the, which amendment, but the one that impacts on slavery. Mm -hmm. So you have at one stage saying it's perfectly all right, equal but different. And then much later, the, the court saying, no, everyone has the same rights. But it's the same constitutional provision that's being interpreted at two different points in time. Okay, so when you when you keep when you have that in mind and you think about how it is that the institutions then approach their their task, um, you will find that in Malaysia, there's a tendency to be quite um, subjective in how one looks at certain guarantees or certain protections afforded by law. That's a problem, right? So if you ask me whether that's been addressed, I think we are in the process of addressing it. And I'm happy to say that the judiciary has, has, uh, has started taking a very active position in, in cleaning up um, this situation, uh, making it less ambiguous, and ensuring that at least the, the boundary lines are being redrawn clearly to say that you can or cannot do this, or in, not in micro terms, or in not micromanaging specific agencies or institutions, but in just stating what the law is. I think that's happening, and that's a really, really good thing for us. Um, so, no institution, no person is above the law. That's the rule of law. Every agency, every person involved in, 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 pub, in the public sphere in this country is accountable somewhere. The judiciary is that ultimate uh, bastion of, of protection for society, 
and accountability happens that way. But it's not the only way. It can happen through um, uh, commissions that are independent. For example, uh, this idea about the Independent Police uh, Misconduct Commission. Yeah, that's one example of how it could be. Um, the speaker has suggested maybe looking at ombudsman. Um, so there are many ways of bringing accountability. So coming back to your question, I'm sorry, I've been quite long-winded about this, but coming back to your question, uh, where does rule of law stand? I'm paraphrasing. I think it's in an interesting place because, as I said, all of us recognize that it has a place in this country. Nobody wants to be seen as acting uh, in a way that, that defies the rule of law. But the space to subjectively interpret what that means is narrowing in a way that it should be narrowed, meaning that institutions like the police, the MACC, and other agencies should not be given the discretion to interpret law at whim. So, for example, do I have to give you a right of counsel when I arrest you? One, one thing we used to hear a lot of was, well, it doesn't say in the law that I have to, but we'd say, damn it, the Constitution <laughs> guarantees right yeah. of counsel, but it only applies this way and not that way. And then you don't find the Attorney General's Chambers taking a position on that, et cetera, et cetera. But those kinds of um, roadblocks or impasses used to happen quite frequently. So you never get any clarity. The preference was just to just to push it aside and carry on with life. But because of certain cases that have come up, and the one that comes to mind now is Tony Poa's uh, suit against the former Prime Minister for Najib Razak for misfeasance. You know, so I had the privilege of arguing that in the federal court. And the bench, uh, bench of seven, I think, agreed with us that how can any one person be above the law? So if uh, a, a minister is in a place, is, is in a public office and wields the kind of power, extremely, you know, important uh, things, uh, imp uh, sorry, in huge amounts of power, which were meant to be doing important things for the sake of the country, why is it that they can't be held accountable for that? They should be even more accountable. Absolutely. Right? And that's Based what, on that premise. No, and, and that's what the federal court ultimately said in, in, a, in uh, what uh, I think is a stunning judgment because it makes the point that no one is above the law. And that I think might have been unthinkable 20 years ago. I um, would have, yeah. Of the bench of seven, how, how many dissented? No, there many? was no dissent. It was a unanimous judgment. Seven and zero. Yeah, um, seven, yes. Okay. So, um, and I think it was delivered by Justice Namni. So you have these judges now. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's very good. And I think the Chief Justice has said many, many times now, every time she speaks in public at various events, she reiterates the importance of the rule of law. She reiterates the independence of the judiciary. She reiterates the need for judges to act without fear or favour. Do you ever fear of the a return to the days of 1988, um, May Day for Justice, um, the entire bench was just removed? Well, uh, do, do you think there's ever a risk of that ever happening again? Well, I think the risk will be minimal if we keep on pushing um, for the kind of uh, uh, impediments that, that I'm discussing now, that I'm sharing with you. So if we support the institution, uh, in particular the judiciary in what it's doing, and, and make sure that the, the, the powers that be recognizes that the judiciary commands the respect and confidence of, of Malaysians, then that's going to be uh, less likely to happen. I mean, just think about it. Right? Look at how much of a rock star uh, uh, Baroness Hale became after the Brexit judgment, the most recent one about Precisely. the proroguing of Parliament. And I mean, I think even in England, that kind of outpouring of support from, from, from everyday uh, people, right, uh, ordinary persons on the street, for an institution that is such an abstract thing in the minds of people, uh, she became such a such a hero for for young uh, um, English uh, people. Um, similarly, here I think whenever you've seen positions being taken by the bench, generally a lot of support. So as long as we continue to support the efforts of the judiciary, and that's a two-way thing, I think the judiciary also has to also appreciate that it doesn't exist in vacuum, and that in order for it to function effectively it needs to preserve the confidence of, 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 of the people. Exactly, so yeah. because if you believe that the judge is in a way compromised, he wouldn't go to the yeah. system because and it's expensive, yeah. time and money. One, and also um, the integrity of those decisions is only as, um, how do I say, as um, demonstrable as the level of confidence that people have in that system. You think about it, right? 
all of us have got together and say, all right, you're the, you're the judge. We've all decided you're the judge. So you can only be as effective a judge as our confidence in you allows. It's a two-way street. It is. So, so the, the judiciary has to, and I, I, coming, as I said, coming, sorry, looking at what the Chief Justice has been saying, um, and that's not just a message to Malaysians, it's she's speaking to the judges of the court. Uh, that's, that's really, really good. Um, uh, because she's making it known to people that she's not going to allow the judiciary to be seen as being anything other than independent, but the proof is in the pudding. So people have to now say, yes, we, we accept that these are, these are valid judgments and so on and so forth. Right? So, and I think obviously all these um, 1MDB related cases and the corruption cases are going to be. It's very important that all those go through because it also delivers business confidence, yes, right? Because yes. if the judge, if the courts are somehow now told to take different directions yeah. um, with a new administration coming in, then it also sends the wrong signals to the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, this is not to say a judge shouldn't decide as the judge thinks is right, but the decision well, we must the be. Law. The law yeah. can be argued any which way. But, but the facts are what they are and the judge applies the law to those facts. And so um, ultimately, whatever the decisions are, they must be justifiable in a way that people can accept on the law. You, you get me? So that's important. So I accept that, uh, uh, I, and I agree with you, that these cases in particular, given uh, what they are about and what they represent about how Malaysia used to be, are very, very important in ensuring that ultimately uh, confidence is restored in the country. Uh, sorry, in the minds of um, foreign investors and other uh, persons who who do business in the country, or even Malaysians for that matter, that that the system will work as it should. And um, I'm putting that very clumsily, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that of the three organs of state, the judiciary is so important because not only do they protect the judiciary, is protects Malaysians from unfair encroachments and, and invasions of, of, of our rights by the government. They also ensure that we have a neutral space uh, that allows us to flourish as a society, and that includes on the economic uh, side of things. Um, well, this is also an, an, an unofficial fourth part of the equation, which is the media, right? Yes. Which is the fourth estate. Yes. Um, and we, as you know, have been, we've been struggling. We've been trying to make it happen these past few years. It's been getting better l the last few years, though. Um, one one is what it's going to be like going forward, though. Yeah. No, I, I think in terms of um, media freedom, uh, at least officially, um, uh, um, perhaps not in that phase where the Sedition Act was being used quite as, you know, so freely, but um, generally I think uh, the sentiment was that media should be given more freedom. Right, and there was some uh, there was some relaxing of the printing presses, publications act permit requirements, and so on. Okay, but might have could have been um, dismantled, but wasn't. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, and and yeah, the one MDB situation made things problematic because suddenly the, the there was a need, so the edge got shut down, and so on. Then after that, uh, it appears that the 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 government, the Pakatan Harapan government was quite uh, happy to take its hands off and let the media run its course. And yes, I, I agree with you. I hope that doesn't change. But I would say that I think maybe the media also needs to up its own game. Absolutely. I agree with you. And, and improve its uh, skill set um, so that you know they can start reporting in a way that uh, Malaysians can appreciate more fully. Um, we've, we've, I think we've gone beyond sensationalist uh, uh, news uh, reporting in a way. Um, Have we? Not really. <laughs> no, I, no, what I mean is I would like to think that we should be beyond that and we should be now focusing on, 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 on more important uh, things, issues related sort of reporting. I think uh, standards of uh, reporting in courts could improve tremendously and that would play a very, very big part in helping in, in restoring confidence in the courts. Um, and so rather than getting sound bites of, of judgments or what's being said, if, if you had actual court reporting in the way that it, it happens in, say, the UK or, or the US, you, pe more people would, would begin to understand how judges are arriving at decisions and, and the idea that those decisions may be skewed because of certain considerations would, would diminish. And people would start getting uh, a clearer idea that, yeah, okay, things, things are happening as, as they should. Love. But, but this goes in tandem with, with efforts to improve the institutions themselves. So um, the Chief Justice has been talking about um, measures to uh, train 
judges, uh, to improve competency uh, uh, levels within the judiciary, all that is welcome because those are things that would never have been discussed openly before. But it sort of bells the cat and says, all right, now we know that, yes, there is a need for improvement of standards, and this is what we're going to do about it. And, and that's welcome. Similarly, I think other institutions should, and I think the Prime Minister Muhyiddin should take steps to, uh, to, to sort of look into that to see how you can improve um, uh, the, the skill sets in, in the various institutions and not just leave it as it is. Um, and of course, underlying all of this is a, is a drastic need to take a, a long, hard look at our education system. You know, which is at the root of everything. I, I mean, if if the if the system of um, uh, Bhumiputra quotas is to continue, and you're recruiting from local universities, which which is the case, and got no issue with that, then you got to make sure that the rec that the graduates of these local universities are being educated in a way that they should, and that then puts attention back to. Uh, um, how, how competent are the lecturers in the universities, how conducive for education are those universities, etc., etc. So it's not just about where they sit on the time scale of, of things, but rather whether they're actually doing their job of producing uh, Malaysians that are uh, employable and who are capable of getting into uh, the system and contribute rather than be part of the problem. They could then become change agents. But you know this is a huge thing, and and, and that's, we have to we have to somehow at some point say yes, this is a priority issue for the country. It is, you know. I think um, one of the problems I can see is through successive uh, administrations, you have um, uh, this quick fix uh, idea. So you bring in somebody who's who's skilled. Right, um, uh, be it Idris Jala or whoever it is, to come in and say, "Okay, you know, you're a, you're a superstar in the private sector. Come in and help us." Yeah, that that person may come in with great ideas, but if you're dealing with a civil service that has certain notions or certain um, uh, hesitations or reluctance or certain impediments or whatever, then after a while, the system is going to just overwhelm the so-called change agents. You see, so you have to take a look at the civil service and say, okay, how do we address that? And then, if you if you want to deepen that discussion a bit further, if, for example, we were to say, identify priority civil service departments. I know it's hard because every everything's a priority, but let's just say, okay, um, customs, M O H, uh, all the health, yeah. Okay, that's one. Uh, I would say the judicial legal services for one, okay. or and I'm not saying these are the only two, yeah. as compared to certain other civil service uh, <laughs> departments, right? Perhaps these departments should be treated as um, exceptions, so that the recruitment policies could change. Politically, I don't almost know about impossible. that. Sure, I accept that, but it means having to recognize that. Unless something is done one way or the other, then it, if these, if this is where the talent pool is, and this is where you know administrators are coming from, or, or be it judges or, or whoever, then you have to accept that. Then then you're you're self-limiting. Absolutely, isn't it? Um, and then how can you say that we want things for the better? Because you're saying at the outset we can only go this far. I mean, you think about the, uh, the World Bank report that was done on the education system when uh, the Prime Minister was the education minister. And it was great that we opened ourselves up to accreditation. Okay, there was, I can't remember the name of the, the test, but we finally did it. And then we saw that we were quite, quite low <laughs> compared to <laughs> Singapore and other, I mean, 15 year olds who can't really conceptualize how to deal with problems and so on and so forth. It was, it was pretty damning. So the World Bank wrote a report to say what could be better, what could be done better. How could uh, tax dollars be used to, to improve the system most efficiently? And one of the things they said was, well, the kind of people that have been recruited really should never have been recruited in the first place because they didn't even meet the standards, raising the question of why they were recruited. And then what do you do with them? One of the suggestions from the Malaysian side was to say we have to retrain. So the World Bank said, why are we wasting more money retraining people who never made the grade in the first place? You see? So uh, that's just a snapshot of how reality works. But if we're going to keep ourselves blinkered to that, to, that, to that, and then at the same time expect great change and transformation to happen, 
it's you know without a genie in a bottle it's not going to happen it's not it's not it, nothing's going to really move and if anything it's just going to be a very slow process that you know may we may not have the time for in our lifetime so I think really the situation is, is, is that. Are we prepared now to confront the reality of where we are as a society without you know, uh, crutches and so on and, and smoke and mirrors to hide it and ask ourselves really, really directly where do things stand? And if we are, are we then prepared to come up with solutions? If we aren't, then we'll just keep on uh, playing, uh, you know, musical chairs and wayang kulit or whatever it is that that happens, lah, you know. But that's that's the reality, I think. And everything that we're talking about fits into that, I I think, you know. So in all this discussion about <laughs> the zeitgeist, Imtiaz, I forgot to ask you about your yourself personally. I mean, yeah. you're a professional, mm. as all lawyers are. Uh, you, also got, you also run your own, your own business, yeah. uh, as you do. Yeah. Um, how do lawyers make it happen nowadays? Um, how do professionals make it happen nowadays? Because there's a plethora of professionals in the fields. There's a whole yeah. bunch of lawyers, a whole bunch of doctors. Yeah. Um, advice to the young lawyer, advice to the young professional. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, just, as, just by way of background very quickly, um, so I got admitted to bar in 1994 here in Malaysia. and. Were you a local yes, grad? Yes, I, I, I did my first degree at the Islamic University. Okay. Um, That's got a good reputation, by the way. Um, I think it was a bit better then than it yeah. is now, but I, it's improving, I must say, um, and I'm going to get to why I think it's improving. Um, and then I, you know, for various reasons, I set up my own law firm in 97 December. So that was quite Just soon Just three up. years in. Three yeah. years in. Yeah, that's a, big, um, that's a brave move. Uh, well, you know, I don't think it was brave as much as it was uh, uh, desperation. So I had reached a point where I thought, you know, for various reasons, I didn't want to work with anyone. And honestly, I had nothing uh, other than you know, supreme sense of confidence in, in, in what might happen and a high threshold for pain. Uh, so, I, and you know, it, foolishly, I set up during the '97 crisis. So yeah, the worst, worst time of all, the Asian time, financial you know, crisis. And I remember, you know, it was it was so bad because number one, I didn't come from. Uh, I mean, I'm from Penang, so I didn't Who have. Are you? Yeah, I never realized yeah, that. Yeah, I'm from so, so am I. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, um, uh, and you know, no family of academics, so really no business contacts or anything like that. Um, and so it was basically making cold calls and saying, you know, I can do this for you to other lawyers. Because I sort of had an idea that I wanted to be an advocate. I didn't want to run like a conveyancing firm or anything like that. I wanted to be a, a, like a barrister. Um, so cut, cut to the present. So now the firm has been going for what, 20 plus years, 22 years, 23 years this year. And we've got, um, uh, it's me and four other lawyers and, and staff and so on. And it's, um, it's like, I guess what you could say was a boutique uh, uh, practice that specializes in um, complex uh, and high, high value disputes. Um, and um, because I did all that controversial work in between, I was doing a lot of constitutional human rights work, in particular in the area of uh, freedom of religion, uh, and in Islamic conflicts, um, so I does that kind of make your name? And do you have to make your name as a professional nowadays? I think you do if you want to, if you want to do advocacy work and you want people to recognize you for for being a lawyer capable of doing complex work. Then obviously it doesn't hurt to get your name in the papers. Yeah, because lawyers in the past they never used to speak up and speak but, out but I, I and advertise themselves. Well, we're not lawyers. allowed to advertise, right. and I see you know on LinkedIn quite a number of young lawyers. Uh, doing quite a bit of self-promotion. I, yeah. I don't agree with that um, because I think, yes, while it's important for people to know who you are, it's equally important for you to spend time in building your skill set. It's extremely important. So one of the things I've tended, uh, I've seen in this last few years or maybe five years, ten years, has, a te has been a tendency for young lawyers to want to get into human rights work because they think it's exciting and it's challenging and so on and so forth. Yes, well, it is. But as I tell my juniors uh, and other lawyers I come into contact with, um, it, it, it doesn't matter what area of law you're practicing in. I, when I talk about it, I mean in litigation. Uh, because whatever you're doing, be it a contract dispute or a commercial dispute or a constitutional dispute, when you stand up before a judge, you have to be supremely prepared for, for what's to come. 
which means then you have to have the kind of experience that will allow you to anticipate, to be of assistance to the judge, to have researched the matter thoroughly enough, and so on and so forth. So and if you ask me, ultimately the clients will come to know you as that. If you are that, that's what will draw them to you, and that's what will get you the work. It's not the, it's not the fact that you have your name in the papers all the time. People might give you uh, one or two cases which you may or may not mess up because you're, you, you're, you're all about that as opposed to the, to the actual ability. So my advice to young lawyers, and I, I say this all the time to my colleagues, is one, uh, be prepared to work extremely hard um, and be prepared to, uh, to accept that you really are nothing when you start, uh, as a lawyer, I mean. You How many years did you think it should take, the typical lawyer? Well, I guess to, it really to, to build a it, good uh, portfolio, a good number of hours under your yeah. Bed. I mean, I I think it's very hard to say because I mean, even me, I you know, I I I I said about it in a very I guess unorthodox way from the perspective of my seniors at that point. But um, I guess that the, the the simple way of looking at it is if you're prepared to get you know, s completely hammered by a judge and with all your faults on full display to the world at large, go for it. Then but you should. Yeah, but, but, but at some point, that has to, be, has to be balanced against your ability to deliver for your client. No, you could, you, to, uh, yeah. you, you know what I mean. Yes. So, so if, you're, if you can't if you're, keep on screwing up. If you're being hammered because you're incompetent or you're not clear, then you're not, you're not ready. Y you see what I'm saying? So, um, Sometimes you go into the federal court, right, and you have maybe 20, 25 minutes to make a point, right? And That's people not say, long. no. And people say, wow, all that is only 25 minutes. But you, look, you think about it, right? I, you, I don't know if you've seen anything to do with the US Supreme Court. They get 30 minutes. Yeah. So there's been this movie recently about Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the basis of sex, and that gives you an example. You get 30 minutes, and then you get told to apportion your time between your opening and your rebuttal. And, and you have these lights or these buzzers or whatever. In the Australian High Court, they have buzzers. It's full on. It's full on, and you're not allowed to extend time. So the ability to distill it down to that point uh, that you want to make and, and argue your case on that one or two points is the scariest thing in the world. I'll share a story with you. So in my early days, when Sri Ram was sitting in the Court of Appeal, I'd go in and say, how many points do you have? And because I was a bit nervous and, and like lacking in confidence, you never want to give up you know, what you think are your security points. So you say, six points. And then he goes, rubbish, you have only one point. <laughs> then you say, OK, OK, no, I think I have two. I'm telling you, it's one point, right? <laughs> okay, he so, saw right through you. Yeah, but then, but then at the same time, when you watch Sri Ram when he was in practice and now again, he'll say, I have two points, but he'll speak about six things. Yeah. But he, he'll carry it in his way. Uh, you know, he's, he's great that way. It's, it's wonderful to see. And, and that's the confidence that they bring to Ben uh, and that rapport that you have with the bench. So that's a big part of it. But it's also understanding your case thoroughly so that you can stand up and, I, and say, look, let's abandon all this other stuff. I want to talk to you about this one point. This is the issue as I see it. And understanding that the judge is going to be able to say, well, what about these other things here? Do they feed into it? And then having that, that dialogue with the bench. And also understanding that you're there not, not just to win your client's case, but to present the best possible version of your client's case so that the court can make a fair decision ultimately. And what we're seeing right now is a tendency for lawyers to take shortcuts on that, younger lawyers, because the win is everything. Promoting the win is everything. You know, uh, it doesn't matter how you got there. Uh, it doesn't matter that the judge came to a complete wrong idea of things because you're perhaps not c comprehensive enough in the way that you explain things and, and relying on you, the judge may have come to a different view and, and so on. So it's, it's a very complicated process, but ultimately it comes back to one, uh, gaining the respect of the bench, uh, um, ensuring the bench looks at you not as a, um, a hostile, uh, looks at you as someone who the bench can rely on to be straightforward, objective, uh, well-researched, and so on and so forth, and diligent in what you're doing. Within, to some, within the extent permitted, tactical, because that's part of the strategy of litigation, um, and ultimately always ensuring that your client knows that you are acting in your client's interest as much as you possibly can. Um, and I think that's something that you can't do overnight. You have, to, you have to build your ability to do that, 
through uh, understanding the law and uh, understanding court craft, understanding advocacy, uh, understanding uh, neuro-linguistic programming, <laughs> looking at judges' faces and so reading on and so forth, the, yeah, everything. Yeah. Uh, it's, reading it's a the crowd and reading yeah, the judge. Yeah, yeah, and which is why I think many senior lawyers, much older than me, will tell you they're still learning. I know, I still am. Um, uh, I'm lucky because um, because I have my own practice. I can do the kind of work I want to at the moment. It used to be that I, I would have to do whatever paid. Uh, now I can afford to be a little bit more um, discerning. Um, and, and I'm lucky because that keeps the interest alive. And because I get to do a, quite a bit of complex commercial uh, disputes that have a constitutional uh, dimension, um, that uh, keeps the process uh, real for me. And, you know, um, s speaking now as a more senior lawyer, I can see, you know, that, that judges are really open to hearing different perspectives. But you have to make them interested in hearing that, that perspective. And I think the tendency to just brush aside judges as being lazy or being, you know, whatever it is, not competent, is just too simplistic a response to the situation. Um, I think judges have different backgrounds. Some of them may have been prosecutors, so they have a particular, uh, uh, how do you say, they have more experience in criminal law than they do necessarily in commercial law. And then they end up in commercial courts or sitting in the Court of Appeal on commercial cases. Understanding that about them, you would think that the best way to approach it is making sure they understand within, within propriety, of course, uh, what they need to look at and so on. So it's, it's actually a, 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 a process of, of you know, relationship building and communication that's, 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 to me, makes the law an amazing thing, which is why I'm still practicing it, you know, with less hair than I had before, I guess, but, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's great. So advice to young lawyers is that, you know, work hard at what they're doing, and, and you have to have faith in the system, and you have to have faith that you're going to get the result that is warranted, Yes, there will be disappointments, but that shouldn't be a reason for you to turn to the dark side or, or anything of that sort. It should, it should spur you on to thinking about how, um, how you can improve your approach next time. And honestly, this is something that we still do. You know, we do post-mortems on, on our arguments in court, especially when we've lost, right? You go back and you think, well, one of, most lawyers are, are, are masochists that way, so we tend to you know, self-flagellate a lot at night and, and <laughs> when we're thinking about what we did wrong in court. And you think, how, how could I have done that better? Yeah, how could I have said... But you've got to do that, though. Yes, right. and then at the same time, I invite comments from my peers uh, well, my juniors in, in the firm that we're all peers, um, to tell me, look, how did I do that wrong? Uh, what could I have done better? How could that point have been delivered? You know, did I miss something? Was someone saying something or whatever? And you have to be completely open to being told that you were a complete doofus in court. You know, you should, you should never have said that. Why did you say that? You know, uh, and that's part of the process of, of, um, of uh, improving. And I, I, lastly, I think you have to accept that you're part of a team, you know. I can't do what I do without my juniors because they provide the support for me to do what I do. Obviously, at the end of the day, I'm responsible. I'm on my feet. I would have, yeah. I'm delivering. I would have read the papers and everything, but in the, in the process of getting up for the hearing, preparing the strategy, I work with my, with my colleagues, and, um, and that allows me to get depth of research, depth of understanding on the facts that I may not have been able to if I did it on my own. You know, so um, you have to have a lot of humility, I think, and you have to chuck out this idea that you're a rock star. Um, yeah, I mean, it's nice to think so sometimes, and um, uh, um, but generally, no, it, you you have to understand that you're you're performing a very important function, and you're part of a very important process in court. You're quite different from other lawyers, Imtiaz, in that you have made yourself a very visible figure in the last 10, 20 years. You write prolifically, you've written lots of columns, you appear on the radio a lot, you appear on TV a lot. You are, I, I guess by your own volition, uh, a very visible person. Um, and that kind of, I guess, that's driven your, your persona. Because it's one thing for the judges to know what you're made of, yeah. and what you yourself know, you, know that you're made of, but you've also got to let the rest of the world know what you're made of. Um, you have got to do that in this world of social media, uh, in this world of constant uh, transparency. And I, I think everybody has to realize that that visibility is so important to succeed and to make yourself different from the rest. Do, was that something that you 
um, became aware of b by yourself years ago or did you was it just because you felt you had to be much more visible no I don't think it was a conscious decision at all um, it just happened I mean in the early days you didn't want to be singled out because if you were doing sort of anti perceived right. anti-establishment work it was it was a dangerous thing I remember in 2001 um, we won this federal court uh, appeal on on um, on the ISA it was a big thing it was Ezam and several other people um, from the PKR um, and it, it was a bit of a of a, of a high point because I had my name on the front page of the star you know with the other lawyers Christopher Leong uh, Siva Rasa Haji Sulaiman Abdullah we were all part of a team that argued this thing in the federal court and it was a really good win and so there my name was you know so I was, I was quite pleased so I called my mother and I said you know hey I'm on the front page of the star and she was crying she goes you fool why would you want to do that now I, you know <laughs> so you're going to be a target now etc <laughs> so I know I, 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 I have to say that we didn't court the press um, it was just that in those days um, it was very, um, there was really not much, uh, there were no platforms to speak out. So the litigation in court was a way for issues to be brought to awareness. Newspapers could report what was going on in court, but they wouldn't want to carry, uh, say, an, an opinion piece on the same subject because it was, they were uncertain whether it was something that would be accepted or not. So that the, the newspapers used to follow these cases quite closely because it was a it was a way of talking about the situation without actually talking about it, and so yes, in that way, because I was doing all this stuff, I, I ended up being, um, uh, you know, named in the papers quite a lot, and then that led to um, uh, I was in the bar council and I was I've always been interested in writing. And so then a newspaper offered a column, I took it, and then that became another column and yet another column after that. And um, but what, what was important was to, uh, for me at least, was that it was not about me so much as it was about what the it issue. is that I was trying yeah. to and, and being objective about it. Um, and that objectivity, I think, is, is very important when, when you understand that people in positions of influence and judges are going to be reading these things. So you have to ask yourself, what am I trying to say and why am I trying to say it? If it's about self-aggrandizing, then generally I don't think that's a good reason to do it's it. Secondary, yeah? It's, 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 it's secondary. But um, I, I can't deny the fact that if I have a, f have a column in The Edge, for example, which, which I, I did for a while, and it's, it's my fault that I'm not writing as much now, um, it, it, you know, p certain business people do read those things and I get, I get asked about the column from various people who I meet. Uh, but all that is secondary. Um, um, and it comes back to what I was saying earlier, that if, if you want to make a presence, people have to respect you for your views. And they, have to respect, they will respect you for your views if they understand that you're someone who gives comprehensive thought or at least sufficient thought to issues, uh, who are not, who's unafraid of saying what needs to be said. And then that may or may not translate into how you are as an advocate. And that's not necessarily a good thing for some clients who don't want you to be outspoken because right. they'll perceive you as being whatever it is. So there's a balance. Um, but uh, I, I disagree entirely with the idea of courting uh, social media to, in order to sell yourself as a lawyer. There's, there's a danger in that. I mean, you know, well, the results have to speak for themselves. Definitely. And, and the substance has to back it up. Yes. And, and then, and which is one of the reasons why, uh, and then of course that leads to a skewing of, well, at least traditionally, uh, the bar etiquette rules prevent us from advertising because... Still don't. Yeah. And, and they want, that's to ensure that clients are free to choose who they, on, an, on a level playing field. Of course, that's never going to happen because more senior lawyers or more experienced are going to be talked about. So a lot of my clients are actually other lawyers. I, 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 as I said, I operate as counsel, so I get instructed a lot by other lawyers to argue appeals in the Court of Appeals of the Federal Court. I, I accept that it's useful, but I think there's a balance. So if you're providing uh, constructive uh, input into, into discussions, well and good. But I'm hesitant about the Monica constitutional expert, for example, because it carries with it a certain uh, gravitas or whatever and a certain sense that uh, people may hold on to and say he knows what he's talking about, right? And then I, I sometimes see quite a number of junior lawyers being dis re referred to in that way and I'm, I'm wondering, hang on a minute, when did this happen? Yeah. Not and because like, there's so. no professional envy or anything like that, but I'm just more concerned that people will then say, oh, that expert 
has said this about this subject. And then you think, well, coming back to what I said earlier, our, our worldview as lawyers, as lawyers is very much shaped by our experiences. You know, someone with 30 years, and I'm not talking about me, just anyone, or somebody like Sri Ram who's had this, you know, years and years and years of experience, both as a judge, uh, as a lawyer and then a judge. Obviously, when he's asked to comment on something, he's bringing to bear all of that. And what you're going to get is a, is a measured view on that. Now, it doesn't mean he's right or he's got the only viewpoint on it. But that's the kind of dialectic we, 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 we want, right? But if everybody is being referred to in that way, uh, which the press tends to, because they don't know what else to say, oh, lawyer so-and-so said, then they say, why are you asking this lawyer? Why not that lawyer? Oh, constitutional lawyer said this. Oh, what's a constitutional lawyer? Constitutional expert <laughs> says this, right? So there's this, there's this sort of a weird dynamic that develops around that. Um, it's, it's potentially problematic. Um, so I, I think clever use of social media, why not? If it, if it helps you build your business on sound and an ethical basis um, uh, by reference to your abilities, why not? You know, I, it happens in the UK. Uh, I won't take the US as an example because it's a whole different it's system animal, there. Yeah. But you, know, you see UK firms um, um, uh, writing commentary on their websites, for example, uh, which people refer to. That's, per that's permissible. Yes, yep. uh, writing articles in journals. That's, That's good. That's permissible, yeah. yeah. But not as much, I think, uh, courting uh, the press for, for, the, for the opportunities. La. So, I mean, for me, I mean, if the press calls and it's important enough to speak about, I think uh, if I can contribute, I will. But um, other than that, I, I, would, I generally don't, don't want to. Now, if the press reports a case and I happen to be counsel on it, I mean, that's, that's the way it is as well, because they're all, they're all these court reporters in court all the time. Right? I, I know I'm sounding a bit defensive, but it's not meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So. It was a lot of fun, man. Yeah? It was a lot of fun. Thank okay. you for coming. Hey, pleasure. No so, uh, great honour. Uh, no, no, not at all. And a privilege. <laughs> Bum 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 b